liberalism, as uh, Europeans have used it, we were a catch-all term for their imperialist activities across the globe. From the moment that they began their so-called age of exploration, um, this that particular term um, is an umbrella concept for everything that they've done. So now we understand that the actions were first uh, conquest and then eventually colonization and in areas where they didn't, once they set up in terms of conquest, areas that they hadn't conquered, you know, they entered into some type of trade relationships. Sometimes there were areas where they were allowed to establish a presence and they used it as a trading base. And then that particular location in a century or two becomes the jumping off point for their actual acts of conquest that they move into. Um, liberalism and now today neoliberalism, these are simply just uh, wonderful little terms that claim to uh, over that claim to be a description of free trade and free markets, but in reality, these are simply terms that are used to mask to mask the fact that we have a system of imperialism still in place. That it masks that we still have um, colonial neo-colonial institutions in place, and that the overall nature of the economies, especially in the global south, is one of extraction, and that the resources that are extracted in their natural state are then sent out of the region into uh, for the West, where they will then take them and refine them and then send it back as some process, I mean, some finished product, rather, back into the global south. Uh, you can read a number of different writings when they're going to sit there and talk about liberalism and they make it sound all wonderful. Well, and it is a wonderful thing if you're an elitist and you are in the imperial core, you're in the United States and you're in France and you're wealthy. Yes, liberalism is a wonderful system. Neoliberalism is great. But if you're a worker, it's not so great. If you're working in imperial core, it's actually not great. But you don't really know so much that it isn't because you're dealing with the struggle for survival. So we didn't look at liberalism, rather, and international trade. We need to remember that there are basically two issues that Europeans were concerned with, were concerned with and are concerned with. And that is barriers or restrictions to trade and what is going to be the medium of exchange in which trade is conducted. Let's take for just an example. Let's look at uh, Japan. For a few, for a couple of centuries or so, several, the Japanese closed off their entire island. They wanted no parts of dealing with the West. They didn't want no parts of dealing with the French, the Dutch, the English, the Americans, any of them, until Japan was forced to enter into the liberal order into global trade controlled by the Europeans. They were forced at gunpoint. And that was how the West removed the barriers or restrictions to trade with the islands of Japan. When we look at uh, barriers and restrictions to trade or whatever, and we come to ourselves here in West Africa, in Central Africa, and East Africa, North Africa, South Africa, when the Europeans entered in, well, how did they uh, remove these barriers or the restrictions to trade? Well, initially we know that when they set up shop here, they were looking for free labor. And so you had the entire European slave trade, uh, transatlantic. We know that when the Arabs, Arabia, and they ended colonizing across North Africa and intermixing with the indigenous peoples in the region, or actually intermixing with the previous colonizers who were the, Byz uh, the Romans of the Byzantine Empire, who were also um, wrapped up with the Romans of the Western, what had become the Western Roman Empire before it falls, 
And then, you know, there were the Germanic invaders who had overrun the Western Roman Empire, you know, the Visigoths and whatnot, and their movement, about 80 to 100,000 of them into Northern Africa. So you get the Arabs come in on top of that, and they're intermixing with these people. And then they are engaging, and their primary uh, resource that they are engaging in trade with is the uh, Trans-Saharan, the Arab Trans-Saharan slave trade. So that's a very big component of it. And if we really want to talk about liberalism, that's what it is. It's, you know, cheap labor. Europe needed it because they didn't have any people. They had what? They had the various plagues that had crippled the doggone population in Europe. At the time, you had uh, the fact that they had waged, I mean, the people had, they had points in their history where they talking about the Hundred Years' War. I mean, they were just slaughtering one another for decades on end, and they had crippled their population. And so, well, they needed manpower in terms of the new colonies, starting with the Portuguese and the Spanish, you know, these colonies that they set up in the Americas, you know, so the, the, Spanish, and, the Spanish and Portuguese really didn't hide anything. It was pure con conquest. They weren't like, well, we're going to have a wonderful trade, you know. Starting with Columbus, it was conquest, it was slaughter, it was enslavement. And then as the population was being, was dying off from the, the diseases that these people brought, where well, they needed a, a population. And so, you know, they in cahoots with the Catholic Church, which was simply the means by which the Western Romans were able to maintain power. So they were like, they traded in the scepters and the, the, uh, scepters and the other clothing of political power and it's like okay, we have ecclesiastical power a spiritual power you know became a catholic church and then these people working in cahoots with the spanish and the portuguese you know they say okay you can go over here to africa and you can enslave these people and so you know then you get this entire beginnings of the transatlantic uh European slave trade. And so this is pretty much what liberalism has always been about. You know, it's that cheap labor and there's no ch labor cheaper than what enslaved, slave, enslaved labor. So the, the way they eventually got rid of barriers to trade over here was it, once the trade and enslaved Africans was no longer lucrative for the British, you know, and it's like, okay, it's time to end this, because so it, it's no longer, it's not a viable means of uh, labor acquisition for the British. And then they began to turn their eyes toward the seizure of land and conquest. And then once you seize the lands, these different lands of the different peoples through conquest, you know, now you've pretty much you think you've pretty much removed all barriers and restrictions to trade. Now, what barriers and restrictions still remain? While these nations were uh, trading their prisoners of war to the Europeans for um, whatever goods they were receiving, their domestic economies were still subsistence economies, and I use subsistence not in the negative connotations of the West, but these were still economies where they were based on autarchic, art, autarchic homesteads and where food security was in the hands of the individual farmers in the village. And so these, the, the domestic economy had no need for Western goods that were being made outside of the country because you know you, you were self-sufficient, so most of what you were using, you made yourself. So that's a barrier to trade. That's a restriction in, to, in terms of trade for Europeans because since you're self-sufficient, well, you don't, you know, European trade, the medium of exchange for European trade is the currencies of these countries. And but well, well, I don't need all your stuff. I don't need to work for you to get your currency and whatnot. So that can hamper the uh, concern, the liberal concerns of the uh, conquerors who are ruling Europe at the time. And so, but once you have conquests, once you colonize, and then, you know, they sent in your, you already had your missionaries who started writing 
these travelogues basically about the different peoples. Then you send in your scholars to really study the people and break down who these people are and how they operate so that you can remove the last vestiges of the barriers and restrictions to trade because you really want these people not dependent on their own labor, not in total control or self-sufficient of themselves, but you want them dependent, basically enslaved in terms of wages to this system over here. And you can do that once you have conquest and then you smash the old traditional system that was in place. But that's, uh, and we, so we did liberalism and international trade, that's our two concerns. Medium of exchange, but they don't want you to have control of your medium of exchange. They wanna maintain control of the medium of exchange. And so right now the medium of exchange is um, somewhat still centered in the United States with the US dollar, but you get other uh, Eurasian countries, emphasis on the Eurasian, who are attempting to establish other mediums of exchange in global trade, setting up other institutions to engage in trade in the long run, even in the short term. It is of no utility to the grassroots of the African continent. It is not in one iota going to change in any appreciable manner the lives of the people but as long as we don't bring in the statistics, as long as we don't bring in the policy analysts that are gonna actually project this out and study it and break it down for the people, you're gonna just get to see, you're gonna end up having more of the same and you'll have a minuscule increase in the so-called middle class within these countries. Minuscule is statistically insignificant by far. So anyway, uh, so now when we talk about these today in these neo colonies, because obviously, you know, there's flag independence that occurred in the 60s uh, from what I say, 1950, 1956, if you start with the Sudan, when it gets its quote unquote independence all the way to 1994, when South Africa elects, gets its flag independence and elects a black president. Uh, now you have neo colonies, but you still have the same issues in terms of trade, which is, you know, the existence of barriers or restrictions of trade and the medium of exchange in which trade is going to be conducted. And so now all of these neo colonies, well, they've been told, well, you know, it's, it's free trade, it's free markets. So there are certain things you have to do, certain things you have to have in place. Now, when we have, you have political and you can have technical barriers to trade. Uh, political barriers to trade are erected wherever different political authorities decide to prohibit or restrict their citizens' access to foreign goods and services. As we know here on the continent, there is no restriction to that because the uh, economies of a neo-colony are in no way controlled by the political leadership or the grassroots of the neo-colony. Those economies are controlled by outside forces. Wonderful way to do that is through foreign direct investment. So even though you have these economies and you have people that have memorized in these wonderful universities and you know they've taken finance, they've taken economics courses and they've studied or they've memorized these things, no, the basic, cons the basic idea that who is controlling that economy it escapes them because they don't control it in any way, shape, or fashion. All right, so. A quick question. Uh, yes. Don't lose your train of thought, but if you could, if you're mentioning these neo-colonies in relation to neoliberalism after the 50s, basically after World War II, or according to the text, a lot of these policies began to be put in place uh, globally after the war. And then after that, you have these neo-colonial uh, revolutionary struggles or liberation struggles describe the advantages of those uh, anti-colonial revolutionary and liberation struggles on the continent. Um, oftentimes we look at those situations as uh, victories and successes 
even though I'm sure you'll explain uh, how what we see as being progress, what we see as being progress may or may not have been in the neo-colonial paradigm. Okay, so when we look at the, we'll say the various independence move, emancipation or independence movements, one thing, if we go back and we go back to, to France Fanon, when you have a neo-colony and it is basically, I say, handed, it, it receives emancipation. It didn't have to wage a military struggle for its uh, so-called independence. When that is the case, you're going to end up with a situation where the economic and political institutions of the colony are still going to be in place. You're simply going to have a leadership put in place, still trained from outside of the country. And you're generally going to, what we found when we look, what we see when we look at the history is you ended up with two different types of uh, leadership classes. If you take Ghana as an example, in Krumah, there wasn't a violent military struggle in Ghana. And in Krumah talks about it, you can see it in his book, Revolutionary Path, where he discusses that there wasn't that violent type of struggle. And so what you end up, ended up having initial in the early stages within the country was you had people who had joined with, in, in, with the CCP and for the purpose of uh, gaining independence, but they did not have the socialist outlook of the CCP. It, you, had, you had a number of people who were not actually socialists in their thinking. So when you look around 60, 61, you'll see in Chroma beginning to put in place policies and institutions where they could engage in the ideological training of the people. And, you know, so that you could actually turn out persons with the mindset that you need to build a country. And so then when you look at Ghana under Nkrumah, you will see that he was following a development path for the country where the country would be able to become self-sufficient in terms of what it was doing with the resources that it had available. They were simply not going to extract bauxite from the country. They weren't going to simply just grow cocoa and any other resources that they had and then send it overseas or whatnot. But they were going to build the plants and everything that they needed to transform these into items that they had use of. They were going to create jobs. Everything was going to be based along a more cooperative economic perspective. Now you had other neo-colonies where the persons were well-trained in liberalism, neoliberalism as we're calling it, as we would look at it today. And they followed wholesale the prescriptions coming out of Paris, the prescriptions coming out of London, the prescriptions coming out of Washington, D.C. And so now, and, so, and obviously you get, you could take Kenya as an example under uh, Kenyatta, where you get a wholly um, capitalist order that comes in place. All of the wealth is concentrated at the top and the rest of the people are basically struggling. And then you, and so there's that. Now, in the areas where there was a revolutionary struggle, and we'll take Eritrea as one example, and we will take uh, Guinea-Bissau as the other. In those two areas, there was a political struggle, which means that when you engage in a political struggle, I mean, a, a national liberation movement, and it is a, a military struggle, well, what happens is, you know, you're fighting against the powers that exist. And so as you liberate territories, you've got to build a number of institutions. You've got to, you know, put in place things that you're going to need to feed the people because you're not getting any outside help. Nobody's helping you for the most part. So you're doing it all yourself. And that's a threat. 
to what occurred to the uh, interests of the West. It's a threat. It's a threat. You look at Eritrea today because they had to fall back on their own blood, sweat, and tears. Well, they're a threat to the interests of the West because anyone who bothers to look there and say, oh, wait a minute, that's how, that is an example of a way that we can go about doing things because they're going to literally be free. And what we see in Guinea-Bissau is that under Amakar Cabral, that's what was occurring. Hence, that's why he was executed, or he was assassinated by the French, because you don't want a country, quote unquote, coming online and having that type of thought process in place. It's why they had to get rid of Nkrumah in terms of the Western powers, because that's not the example you want out there. And so when we look at these, uh, when we look at the liberal order, we look at liberalism, we look at neoliberalism, we look at these neo-colonies that are in place now, that's something we have to uh, keep in mind because, you know, we're engaging in celebrations of so-called independence days. And then you look at the, not the numbers, you just look at the actual country, the institutions in the country, the countries. And you're wondering what the hell are they celebrating? And once again, you got to come back to mathematics. You got to come back to statistics and really look at this stuff. You know, it's very easy to get on the national television stations and talk about innovations that are occurring in the classroom. And, you know, the students are engaging in robotics and whatnot. Some, you know, or coding or other things. And you see this and you say, I guess this is what we're doing. That's normally going on in the neo-colonial uh, capital of the country. And then it's only in a handful, statistically insignificant number of schools in the neo-colonial capital of the country. The vast majority of the schools across global Africa look like shit shows. They're shitty. They're terrible. They don't have the resources. The, the classroom buildings are collapsing in on themselves. So what the hell are these people talking about? Uh, this, these wonderful things that are going on. They don't have textbooks. They don't have properly trained teachers. But we're celebrating this. It was, at best, uh, a mild form of emancipation. And you simply had a trade, you know, you just changed the color of the colonizer. Chen Weizu in one of his articles calls the leadership class of most of these countries, he calls them black colonialists. That's all they are. Because their economic policies, that's what it is. Many of these neo-colonies, you know, you've got these political parties and they're engaged in a struggle for power, quote unquote. You know, they want to be the, you know, they want to be elected in the office. When you look at the economics of their economic policy, the financial aspects of their financial policy. It is still neocolonial, extraction oriented. So does that uh, answer your question? Yes, I appreciate the way you broke that down. I want you to tie in this concept of neoliberalism to Cartesian Newtonian thinking. Because uh, when we hear these terms like neoliberalism, liberalism, it's supposed to be a good thing, but you explain how detrimental it is. Can you explain how, explain how um, that Cartesian, Newtonian thought process or model has convinced most of the world that liberalism is actually a good thing? Okay. When we look at, when we're talking about the uh, Cartesian, Newtonian, uh, the mechanistic orientation of science, we're actually talking about the science paradigm. And with the science paradigm, it does not look outside of the system. The science paradigm is reductionist. So you, you're not, you don't even take the system into consideration. So you begin to set up and you're gonna to put together the uh, research questions that you're 
thinking you're going to look at and your questions start from the walls of the system in, but they don't take the system itself into the equation. They don't even take the researcher who's doing the research into the equation. You know, he's supposed to be objective and value neutral and things of that nature. But in reality, you know, science is funded like everything else. You know, science is conducted. You're getting paid for it. There's money involved. So you've got that issue that's going on there. But when you have the persons that are going to set up your science, when you're dealing with the science paradigm and you're sitting here and you're going to look at the, uh, you're going to look at the particular system itself from the Newtonian perspective, from the Cartesian orientation, well, you're, you're not going to take the system into account. You're going to start with a lot of unstated assumptions with whatever it is that you're looking at. And that's going to also affect what it is that you're attempting to do. If we really look at the origins of what we're talking about, let's go back to Galileo. If we look at Galileo, there are two aspects of his work his empirical approach, and his use of a mathematical description of nature. You know, these are the dominant features of science. You know, it's empiricism and, you know, mathematical description. So now, Galileo postulated that scientists should restrict themselves to studying the essential properties of material bodies, shapes, numbers, and movement which could be measured and quantified. Other properties like color, sound, taste, or smell were merely subjective mental projections which should be excluded from the domain of science. Galileo's strategy of directing the scientist's attention to the quantifiable properties of matter proved extremely successful throughout modern science, but it has also exacted a heavy toll, as R.D. Lang emphatically reminds us. Out go sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, and along with them has gone aesthetics and ethical sensibility, values, quality, form, all feelings, motives, intentions, soul, consciousness, spirit. Experience is su as such is cast out of the realm of scientific discourse. And nothing has changed in the world over the past 400 years when we consider the scientific obsession with measurement and quantification. And that is the nature of the whole Cartesian science that we're looking at, because the goal has nothing to do, the goal of it, because it's supposed to be valueless, it's like you're supposed, you're stating, you're doing this research and you're presenting something and putting it out here, and then it has, it's supposed to be a quote unquote peer reviewed which has been the new thing in science. I'm saying new, but this is something that became a standard beginning around 1973. So suddenly it's peer reviewed and then that becomes a thing uh, that's supposed to provide validity for whatever it is that you've written. But when we look at the nature of the scientific quest prior to Newtonianism and all of that, we look at the ancients, we go back to Kemet, where the goal of science was wisdom, understanding the natural order, and living in harmony with it. Now, if we come back to the talking about uh, the um, Cartesian outlook, the Newtonian outlook to dominate things. You know, you wanted to see what was the natural order, you wanted to establish your society, move in step with the natural order. So you were looking at things from an ecological, an ecological vantage point. You get a science, a Cartesian science that is based on mathematical certainty. Well, you're going to run into some issues because you're not going to be able to formulate the questions that you need to be able to formulate to solve the problems you need to be solving. See, 
and I'm using those terms because no, no matter how we get away, or get, try to get away from it, you're dealing, you must bring in values. The fact, the fact that one says they're going to be objective and all of that foolishness, that's a value. They're saying they're valueless, and to prove their valuelessness, they give you a value. We're going to be objective, that's a value. Then they give you a definition for the so-called objectivity. So you've got a scientist who's being funded telling you that they're object. All right, when we look at the Cartesian uh, outlook where there's a division between mind and matter, well, that's a problem. If we're going to sit here and consider, I mean, it's, it's a problem for us as an African people because that's not our outlook on the world, even though as we stand right now, the so-called scientists that we have are steeped in this particular perspective or outlook on life. That's how they're approaching things in a so-called disinterested manner or whatnot. And so when we look at the Descartes, when we look at Descartes and his outlook, when we look at the Newtonian perspective, when we look at the mechanical uh, description of life, the universe, all of these things in terms of the science paradigm, you are taking the system itself as a given. And you never, con you never bring the system under question. You know, the whole idea is to what? Describe things as they are. You're not supposed to bring prescriptions into the issue. Well, if you aren't going to bring prescriptions into the, the discussion, you're going to simply describe things as they are, assuming that this is natural and evolutionary. Well, you're going to end up with neo-colonies that are going to continue along the same path because they've not even, you know, they're stuck in that um, shell. They're going to be stuck in that shell and they're simply going to be like hamsters on a hamster wheel, just running around in circles, you know, getting the same results, but swearing that they're doing something, swearing that they're moving things forward. And in reality, you haven't done anything because you have not brought the total system into the discussion. If we're in people that are talking about liberation, but well, you must bring the entirety of the system under analysis. And you can only do that if you take a systems design outlook. When you look at uh, the scientific paradigm, when you look at it, it is basically nothing more than a paradigm that if you're going to utilize it for problem solving, you're going to be looking at systems improvement because you're assuming that the system itself, its, uh, its design and its parameters, all of that is set and there's nothing you can change about it. You know, the universe is set, can't be changed, yada, yada, yada. And so then you just continue perpetuating the existence of a neo-colony. Now, if you start to looking at things from a systems design perspective, you know, then you're talking about bringing the entirety of the system under analysis. And you begin to question the basis of the system itself. Cartesian, but the Cartesian outlook, the uh, Newtonian outlook, the mechanistic outlook, that's a wonderful way to maintain the system as it is. Think about it. How many of these doctors and a host of fields do we have out there? And they're posing research questions and they're publishing articles and they are even proffering what they call our solutions to different problems. But seldom do we see any of them even remotely come to the actual heart of the issue. We are a conquered and dominated people. If we start from that, if that becomes the first 
maxim that we're operating from, if that's the first axiom that we're moving from, that's going to take us in a totally different way than if you begin to pose questions on how can I uh, reduce unemployment in my country? If that's your, you're going to ask a question about and reducing unemployment. And then you begin to think, well, we need to create jobs. And then, well, we need money to step. We need investment so we can establish these things. That's a type of thought. There's a, there's a series of natural outcomes that are going to grow from the particular way that you define a problem. But they're not defining the problem as domination and control or domination and conquest and domination and powerlessness. A neo-colony, the leadership of a neo-colony is powerless. But, you know, the science paradigm, well, you, you can't see that. No, that's not true. See, power is, and they give you a nice little trite uh, definition. And as we all know, definitions limit what you can see and how you see. So you get this particular definition, this particular description of a problem, and then you think, well, all we really need is, you know, if we get the technology from the West, if we get the money from the West, if we get the help from the West, then we can move forward and do these things. But you've never brought the, if you start, on the other hand, if you start from a simple proposition that we are a conquered and dominated people, and 60, 70 years after flag independence, we are still a conquered and dominated people. You How do you know this? Say that again? I'm sorry, you lead me to a, 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 another question, which is um, uh, you made a point ab about us being a dominated people and how these structures being put in place um, through economic means, uh, the enforcement of neocolonial rules and domination on African societies throughout our um, last... 70 years or so, you know, we, we've had these different liberation struggles, these freedom struggles, and then you've had political figures attempting to work or operate within this system. Do you feel like they're, uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like as if it's, you know, these things have been a complete waste of time, but do you feel like trying to operate within the system has benefited African nations at all to any degree? Or would you say there has to be some kind of strategic way to pull out of them? Um, and then this, the reading talked about the institution of the International Monetary Fund World Trade Organization. And we've had these political leaders trying to engage with the system for the benefit of their um, neo colonial struggles. Um, what do you say in regards to the relationship uh, African nations have to working within the system? A system has a culture. A system has, a system is designed to do a certain thing. Um, if something comes into the system that doesn't accept the system culture, that doesn't accept the system parameters of operation, the system expels that thing, just speaking generally. It can't stay within it. If we use the human body, which is a wonderful system, what happens within the body when something gets in it that doesn't belong there? If you eat something, and there is something in whatever it is you've consumed that is of no, that is detrimental to your, your, uh, your gut, your body, your body is going to expel that in some way. Quickly, this is how systems operate. So if you have, ah, we have to go back to the economics. We, we should go back just, just to the economics. Um, it doesn't matter if I control your economic thinking, if I control in your, if, if the cognitive economic culture in your head is 
under my control, I don't care about much else. So you can have, you can sit up there and pontificate and pre pretend in the political arena and say all these wonderful statements about you must respect me. That's the thing taking place right now. You have the president of Kenya and they're making statements, quote unquote, that fall underneath the speaking truth to power type thing. Uh, they're doing these things now, but the economics in their head is out of the West. Western economics is imperialist. So you're going to, you can't go to the, uh, as one book put it, the unholy trinity. What's the unholy trinity? The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. You can't go to those three institutions, establish intentionally to maintain Western power, to maintain Western hegemony, and think you're going to be placed within those institutions and you're gonna work with those institutions and you're gonna generate positive outcomes. That's not their nature. What happens when a country goes to the International Monetary Fund? That money comes to the country to allow that country to continue to service its debts to international lenders. Yeah, you can't use, if you look at the World Trade Organization, you look at what's taking place, the, uh, the policies that are put in place are beneficial to multinational corporations. It's beneficial to the governments, the home governments of those multinational corporations in the West. And you can throw in the Japanese uh, coming out of the East. But the, it come, when we look at the economics, then we have to come back to, do we even understand what we're talking about? Systems. What exactly is the system? What do we... You don't work within a system. You don't go into inside of an institution, a system being a conglomeration of institutions in part, you don't get inside of an institution and say, I'm going to change this institution from the inside. No, you're not. You're going to be expelled from the institution. You're going to catch hell within the institution. You're either, you're going to lose yourself in a way with, in the institution, which is necessary because when an institution sees that an individual within the institution is detrimental to the functioning of the institution. And I don't mean the functioning on paper. I mean the actual functioning, what takes place. You know, if there's corruption throughout the institution and you go in and you're going to be fine and upstanding, they're getting you out of there. The nature of the institution is corruption. We're well, not going to keep you in and say, I'm going to work from in and I'm going to change things from the inside. That's not how institutions work. If a virus gets in our body and tries to change things change and, and, and begins to engage in changing us from the inside, that ends in death. Institutions are designed to perpetuate themselves, to continue through reification, all of these things. That's, but we would have to get into an entirely detailed breakdown of a system because we use the term, we see the term, hear the term rather, but we don't really grasp what's going on. The design of this particular, these institutions, these, the uh, IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, the, uh, the other uh, organs of the UN, the African Union, the design of these institutions, the system they are a part of is to maintain the domination of African people. Their design intended, the, the, the design of them is intended to perpetuate the status quo. Having some black faces and some female faces and, and now what, some LGBTQIA faces tossed off in there didn't change the uh, operational design of the system. It follows the same it follows its blueprint to the letter. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. So you've got all of these uh, African countries, these countries in the Caribbean, and they're in some way, shape, or form involved with the World Bank, the 
the IMF, World Trade Organization, they all have the same problems in general. The grassroots of all of our countries are in a survival mode. When you see a country and it's, it's uh, one of its, its first or second industry is tourism, which is simply a glorified form of prostitution, that tells you just how weak the economic foundation of that nation is. When you have a country and it's dependent on a handful of natural resources being extracted and sent out of the country, that's a clear sign of just how weak that country is. So you have to de-link from the global system. You have to separate from it as a people. But that would require some different sets of definitions. There is no co cooperation in this system. You're not going to cooperate with the people who have spent centuries maintaining power and, domin and domination. You're not going to suddenly, okay, we're going to have, we're going to shake hands, we're going to work together. No, nope, that is not the nature of business. But we're not interested at this stage. When we look at these countries, there's no interest in actual liberation. No. They're simply trying to integrate themselves further into the current international political economy. Even though they want to be integrated into it, seemingly in ignoring that international political economy is a struggle for power. But they're not struggling for power. They're begging for investment. Begging for investment. They're begging for money from outside of the country. They're not turning into their own hands and their own abilities to build their society. No. And whenever you look at these countries that are supposed to be um, examples of or positive examples, once you break it down and you really look at that country top to bottom, you see that it's a house of cards. But you know, you can just take pictures and say, oh, look how beautiful this overpass is. And look how beautiful these buildings are because they mimic Western buildings. And, and look how clean the city is. And you say, see, this country is on the move. That's very superficial. And trust me, public policy, you have to move well beyond the superficialities that the average person has been trained in these neocolonial schools to focus on. Yes. You just yes. you led me here to uh, another interesting part that I found in a reading. Um, I'm not going to read it, but uh, just basically what it was explaining how uh, Russia, uh, Russia, the Russian planned economy had to leave a communist path in order to get the resources that they needed uh, from other Western nations. Can you explain how taking that communist path, or maybe not even communist or socialist, but how does having a planned economy uh, divert the capitalist um, neoliberal agenda in regards to smaller um, African nations who are seeking true independence? Uh when we talk about that question, one of the first things we have to go back to is that when we look at the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was not really, uh, once Stalin came to power, was not really based on the works of Lenin. Matter of fact, you would have had a hard time finding persons in the Soviet bureaucratic structure that had actually read Lenin. They had had Lenin interpreted to them, but they hadn't read it. When you look at the Soviet Union, you had a massive bureaucratic state. So the textbook, which is still a, you know, the writers are out of the West. They're saying, well, they had to leave that path in order to get over here and do this. All of those, once we look at this, uh, all of these pathways, so to speak, are not going to really lead us where 
we want to where we some of us want to go because some of us simply want to be we want to move further into the capitalist system in terms of taking the positions within our own neo colonies uh, at the top of the at the heights of the uh, national economy of the neo colony. That's re in reality what's what's wanted, and we want to mimic um, the Western democratic system in, in that fashion. So they're not even interested in actually even a, really studying or attempting to follow the path, say, of the uh, Soviet Union in that sense. Beyond that, um, they don't have the background on the subject in these countries. Even when we're here and persons are saying that they're socialists, if you really probe them with uh, the analytical questions, you know, from the book, the, looking to say the book, The Art of Question, and you really probe, you know, they don't, they have a very superficial, it's, it's a surface level socialism. It's kind of, it, it's across the surface. Um, so your question was, uh, what was it you were saying about the, um, in terms of the Soviet system, in terms of the the African governments, what exactly was it that you said? You asked. All right. So the reading, I think it was page 150, 150, 151 in Global Political Economy. And it mentioned how communism basically kind of interfered with the neoliberal agenda. Um, and we have uh, African leaders who, you know, revolutionary or what have you, who decided at different periods that socialism or communism might be a path toward independence or freedom. Can we actually say that these um, agendas would divert uh, African nations from the neo-colonial, neoliberal agenda? Or, or, or was this just bad thinking? The uh, the assumption that the author is making in that particular area is that there's some type of evolutionary process in terms of the economic systems of a place. With a conquered people, you don't have an economic, you don't have a uh, evolutionary process going. You have you don't have an evolutionary process in place. What you have is a people who were conquered. Someone else wanted what was in their country, wanted to take it out and take it elsewhere. So they put a system on top of that, an imperialist system. So if you are a people and you're supposedly throwing off the conquerors and throwing them out, well, and if you chose to follow a communist path, well, it's not interrupting the natural neoliberal half of the place it's not going to interrupt it because what the author is trying to say is that what they follow if they had just come out and just follow the uh neoliberal or the liberal path from the beginning then things would be a lot better now and that is a complete lie because you're simply assuming that there's something natural and evolutionary about the capitalist system and it's not it's a man-made system you know it's a man-made system that it's imperialist, going back to William the Conqueror and those guys and what they put in place. And it's designed to extract wealth out of a place and to take it elsewhere, back to the uh, home place of the people. That's one thing. All economies plan. There's planning in a capitalist economy. Now, when we talk about the capitalist economy, using the United States as an example, we must also understand that the leadership in a capitalist economy is very socialist. They're moving as a group. They're engaged. It's socialism for the wealthy because they're an oligarchy. So it's socialism within them, within that, those within the oligarchic structure that's running the show. And for everyone else, it is competition, it is dog eat dog, it is a, it's conflict and a struggle for survival. For everyone else, it's free trade, it's free markets. 
So that's the other thing I'm going back to, if we're going to engage in a discussion, we need to start with is that the leadership in those places is very socialist in, in, in how they operate within the structure and how they're dealing with things. They don't engage in free markets and all of that. It's an oligarchy. And we have to keep that in mind. We have to bring that to the forefront of our minds or set that in front of ourselves to understand that in terms of the operating of what's going on. And we need to throw out the whole idea that there's something evolutionary about the uh, systems of economics. That if you just, you know, with, uh, cap with the capitalist system, that if you simply, uh, you put these institutions in place and allow them to follow their natural course, that you're gonna get some, uh, some utopian um, results or whatever. If you look at the United States, you look at Europe, you look at France, you look at all those countries that are where there's capitalist countries there. Well, when you look at their economic systems, where you look at what's happening on the ground now, go and look in the media, the stories are there of what's taking place. So they're struggling with poverty. They're struggling with unemployment. Why? That's the nature of the system. That's the nature of that system. First, the leadership, the oligarchy, it exploits its own people right there within uh, the political confines, which they want to blur away. So they don't want those political borders because there's only so much you know, exploitation you can do of your own home population before they rise up and start slaughtering your heads and flipping the system on you. So if you can get rid of these political borders in terms of economics and you can send your cash or around the world and whatnot, you can uh, prolong your existence a bit longer. Um, the, uh, so those, the, 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 the so-called examples of capitalism, once you go and you look up and down the uh, social ladder in those countries, you see that this is a failed system in reality. It's sent Simply that the media, which is controlled by the oligarchy, because in the United States, you don't have a democracy. That's an oligarchy. When you come to a neo-colony, you've got an oligarchy in control. You know, it's a lie to tell anyone that they can be elected into government, to, to the parliament or to Congress or to be president or to, you know, become prime minister and all these things. Stop lying. When you look at the financial obligations that you have to meet, in order to be able to be considered, you've wiped out 85, 90% of your population. They have, they will never have that opportunity because they're never gonna have the wealth necessary to position themselves in that. These are oligarchies, but you know, they're masquerading, they're being called democracy. And you have this strong struggle to move into, you know, amongst people who or getting some degree of training, calling education to move into that small upper level area. So no, there would have been no, if those countries had followed through with some communist path, or if they had been allowed to follow, if Ghana had been allowed to follow, continue the socialist path that Nkrumah had it on, yes, there was gonna be change there. There was going to be change that was going to take place, that things would not be as it is now. You know, if Lumumba is not immediately killed before he even can get started, yes, because of what was taking place between Nkrumah and Lumumba and other leaders and what their plans were, what they were trying to do, and what the West was constantly undermining through the fifth columnists on the continent who, you know, they love all things Western, and that's not something that like the, the West came and they had to train us up. We've always had people in our midst who, you know, they've liked the foreign thing. And the foreigners can be like, okay, I can use this person to undermine whatever the leadership was. And now that that leadership's gone, where, you know, we got the foolishness that we have where 
well-trained jokers are sitting in places and continuing the operation of the system so that you get the same results. But no, communism didn't interrupt anything because there's nothing evolutionary about any idea that's ever come out of Europe. Mm. Urugu is out of balance to begin with. So it's, no. But obviously okay. the author's going to say that. Well, yeah, that was an interesting part. I wanted to make sure I um, addressed it because, you know, we've had, and we still have, um, African organizations that are internationalists in scope that propagate the idea of taking a communist or maybe more the idea of taking a socialist path toward liberation and in closing I'm give you one last question and we'll wrap it up in in and within a five minute time frame based on the reading we found that trade and market relationships are completely exploitative is there any way that you feel we can begin to look at narrowing these relationships with within a certain time period or the possibility of closing these relationships and uh how might a path in that direction of narrowing or closing these relationships with unequal trade and market relationships be possible for African nations. And you well, mentioned Eritrea as an example. I want you to just expound a little bit on that. Thomas Sankara pretty much told us exactly what needed to take place. And he said that there was no way that we could do it individually in terms of these nations. Um, that if only one country said was going to repudiate these debts, these odious debts, and uh, was going to um, try to move in that direction, all that was going to happen was that the leadership was going to be picked off. And he said that it had to be a regional thing. It had to be um, the different regions, it had to be the countries. We had to do this in unison, even uh, continentally. We had to do it in unison to begin to alter the situation. Um, so it's not as if we have to go and try to come up with some new ideas or reinvent the wheels. We can look carefully at what Marcus Garvey was saying. We can look carefully at what Nkrumah had to say and was doing, what Garvey was saying and doing, what Nkrumah was saying and doing. We can look very carefully at what Thomas Sankara said and did. We can look carefully at what Fidel Castro said and did in Cuba, we can look very carefully at what is going, what the Eritreans are doing now, and we can see the path that we need to follow as a people. We have to keep in mind or we have to be made aware of the fact that these neo-colonies, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, they are non-viable political entities drawn up by colonialists with the express purpose of extracting the wealth from these places, but also weakening the peoples of these places, weakening their any efforts at solidarity. So if you're gonna to adhere to these um, colonial borders, you think you're gonna do something within that given neocolony, it's not gonna happen. Your state is non-viable. It wasn't drawn up with any sense of in any with with any intention or any sense of being a uh, economically viable, a politically viable entity, they were you know they just drew up lines on the map for any of a host of reasons and said okay this is this this is that. When it came time when they saw that they weren't going to be able to uh, hold off independence and you, they really did not want violent a revolutionary, a national liberation independent, because, you know, then you would have regained your man, as Fanon tells us, then you've regained your manhood. You have slaughtered the enemy. It is necessary to kill the enemy. At that point, when you have demonstrated that you are prepared to kill your enemy, that you are prepared to fight and kill for your own self-preservation, you've, you've begun to alter things on the psychological level. 
the examples, and so we didn't have that in so many of these these uh, neo colonies. So the Europeans were able to simply hand over power as much as possible to people that they had handpicked, that they had trained, that they had cultivated, and who were going to you know follow their dictates. We that was done, and you do that because you don't want a bloody revolution. Vietnam was a bloody revolution. And so they're following their own path. They are not under the, uh, they're not under the thumb of the West. They were willing to bleed for their liberation. We can look at some other places where you can find some other examples where the people had to fight to literally be, li um, be liberated. Look at a ritual, 30 years. So, you know, that creates a particular psychology in the people. So, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. St. Carl has already told us. He's, you can look exactly at his speech before the, uh, was it the AU? I mean, was it the OAU or the uh, UN? I forget right now. But you can find that speech and listen to what he says. And he tells you it has to be done group. We need to be working as a group anyway because these neo colonies are not viable as economic entities. Out. Yeah, so then we can pull a lot of the system, but it has to be a group effort. 